Hey, everybody. I guess we'll just get started. Um, let's do a quick intro, a little bit more in depth uh, of all the panelists on board. Uh, maybe we can start with Calvin. Hi, um, my name is Calvin. I'm the founder and CEO of Legitimate. We operate the premier digital ecosystem, uh, now live on Avalanche. Hi. Samantha Bobot. I work for a company called Rockaway. Um, we're a venture investor, but we also run a venture studio. And we've looked at NFTs from both sides of the house. Hi, I'm John from Moongate. I'm the founder and CEO. Uh, we do NFT ticketing and membership. Uh, I'm sure you, some of you have already experienced our product, but there's another after party tonight. You'll be using us again. And uh, my name is Paul. I am the uh, founder and CEO of Notify. We are a Web3 messaging and notification infrastructure provider. Uh, we power a lot of marketplaces for communications and DeFi protocols as well. So uh, yeah, thanks everybody for joining me on the panel. Um, love to really talk about the first real, uh, like, you know, I guess what everyone's thinking about is, which NFTs do you guys currently own today? And why did you buy them? I hold a lot of NFTs. Um, first of all, I hold all of our customers' NFTs because I support my customer. But uh, I think the first ever NFT I bought was Pudgy Penguin, just because it was really cute. And I was stuck in quarantine, and I had nothing better to do. But that's what got me into the rabbit hole. Uh, but once I bought my Pudgy Penguin and got to know NFT, I actually quit my private equity job to jump into NFTs full time started figuring out what I could do more with NFTs. Um, and as I s started exploring more in the space, I realized that actually utility makes a lot of sense. And since then, it's been a roller coaster ride of just building this product and bringing it to market um, in the last kind of year. And just been really happy to see all the reception, all the great feedback that we've received so far. Yeah, so, so I'm either like ideal user research for these guys or totally cringe. And so where I'm going with that is, no, no, I do, I do own a couple, but I was pretty late to the party. Um, so I've looked at companies that work with the space, like portfolio management solutions, valuation, like NFT financialization stuff. Um, but I've never been like an avid collector. So, so to answer right now what I own, um, Oh, it's not there, but my Twitter profile picture was a gift, um, <laughs> but that's an NFT. And then I wanted to experience like the, the metaverse NFT, so I own something called Metaportal, which is supposed to be, it's a 3D interoperable. And the idea is that because I own that, um, I'll have access to other metaverse ready NFTs. So I think of it as like broad exposure. Um, and then I have a, a luxury travel membership pass NFT. Um, that's because a friend of mine had the luxury travel company for two years and then introduced the NFT and I kind of inherited that. So I suppose I've been a lazy adopter and a bit of a voyeur seeking the experience and I'm ready to catch the bug from these guys. So those are some pretty, pretty fancy NFTs though. Like, <laughs> I don't think I have a luxury travel NFT. I'm sure there's a lower brow. Um, Oh, yeah, so the, the Mini Royal, because that similar wire, like, let me experience the gaming one. So whatever's next on the tour. Um, my story is that everything that I've thought was stupid has skyrocketed in value. Uh, somebody told me about punks in 2017. Missed that. I missed cryptoglyphs, autoglyphs. Um, Miss Kitties, and then I guess in 2021, was it? Uh, I thought that pictures of apes were the stupidest thing ever. So I bought one, and that's, that's my first sort of PFP NFT. Um, but yeah, I think more recently, I, I really like what John is talking about, um, supporting our customers. So I've been buying a lot of digital NFTs. Uh, specifically from brands that we work with. So most recently, um, I bought three Ambush t-shirt NFTs that we helped um, launch in Tokyo for their Bright Moments collaboration. Uh, just to kind of like round that off, what is like the most, uh, like I guess, uh, paper, paper hand loss that you have for these NFTs? Does anyone want to share that? I, I'll tell you what, what of mine. Uh, I got a chance to buy a D-God at like $20. 
and uh, missed out on that boat after the founder told me to buy it. During a panel, actually. <laughs> I feel like I already covered, I, I already covered mine. I think you're good. So. <laughs> I bought a lot of imaginary friends. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I bought a witch because I, I wanted to be a witch, no. <laughs> uh, to experience that community. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's gone down a lot in value, if I check. I think that's like the one thing that everyone shares is that we all like uh, had some sort of loss uh, that we can experience. So uh, just kind of going to the next big question is like, what are good examples of uh, good communities or NFTs that have something beyond just a PFP, right? So we know, I, we, I know we talked about a little bit on the utility side, uh, would love to get your thoughts on what you guys have seen uh, have been working beyond just the realm of PFPs. Um, this is actually pretty relevant recently. Uh, I joined a couple of new communities that I feel like have a lot of legs beyond sort of the speculation aspect of these assets. Um, quick shout out to Oni Force, which is making a comeback. Um, met the team in Japan, was not a holder went to like a ton of events, met a ton of cool people, brainstormed about some really cool digital ideas around merch, apparel, how you know we can work with them, how they can work with us, became a holder like that week, right? Another one, um, I know a lot of people, there's a lot of sort of noise brewing around that community, but um, Clonex, I think. I've met some of the Clonex like community members in person, and that community is so like self-supported right now. I know that you know obviously Artifact got acquired by Nike and all that, but just the creativity and sort of that internal dialogue that you're seeing from community members, Clonex holders. I mean, they just launched a Tokyo event that was like 80% like community produced. Like that's pretty much unheard of uh, yeah I mean I can't can't sp say more than that but uh, I think the craziest community I've seen is probably MF -er. um, the JPEG looks crazy um, and I don't know why people would buy them but every single MF -er I've met are pretty very passionate I guess um, regardless of if there are I guess in Asia or in America, they all share the same energy. Um, and like even in Singapore, I was just randomly pulled into like an MF -er hiking group and we went hiking at like 7 a.m. after like a night out. And it was great actually. I met a lot of uh, very smart uh, angel investors there. Um, and I don't know, overall great community, um, yeah. I guess I'll take this one in a different direction, which is um, kind of an NFT drop to a community that you might not think is fertile for it. So there was, if anyone's familiar with something called Hashflow, it's kind of like a one inch competitor DEX aggregator. What they did was dropped NFTs before they launched the token and bef before they announced the tokens would accrue to NFT holders. So presume they didn't know there was a financial component it was sort of just a leaderboard tracker. So for people who put trades through or refer other traders, what was really interesting was that um, like people became fervent about these weird robots that, again, have pretty much you know, nothing to do with like the market maker mentality or traders on that. So probably that. Actually, I suddenly thought of another community that's crazier than mf -er. Uh It's like the... The bear chain guys with BitBear. Yeah, that one's. Uh, I'm a, on their. <laughs> I'm on their spaces, and they're just going like ooga booga, nonstop. <laughs> My friends like uh, BD BD Lead there, and he's just showing me all day on this project. <laughs> I think you know Samantha uh, brought up something that had a little little bit of inspiration, um, and also with the previous panel about um, on chain analysis and and all that. I think. Um, the Paraspace team uh, recently almost got hacked, uh, except a white hat group front ran the, hacker tr the hacker's transaction, um, which scared a lot of people. So for those of you who don't know, Paraspace, DeFi protocol, they actually did NFT lending and like uh, buy now, pay later before Blur rolled it out recently. 
but um, they were really much targeting sort of ape coin staking. Anyway, there was a vulnerability. The hacker found it, submitted a transaction, but screwed up the gas price, got front ran by a white hat group, and the entire community was saved. And they just recently airdropped this Paraspace vault to kind of like, as a joke, commemorate everybody who survived the hack. Um, and somehow it's become sort of just this token of discussion around, you know, what, what constitutes a community, really. Do you guys think that uh, in your experiences that there's any differences between geographical, uh, like, uh, like communities or people that are more interested in NFTs or utilities? From my experience, and we deal with a lot of customers in Asia, um, generally speaking, customers in Asia like to do more like tangible real life utility and that are tied to their NFTs um, besides just like having it as a JPEG. Um, so these could be maybe like a discount at their store, um, event access, um, or kind of other utility. Um, so it's quite good for us because I mean, we're based in Asia um, and we are able to work with a lot of customers uh, directly there. We are, we are, as far as I know, the only guys out there that are doing kind of utility, NFT, end-to-end. Uh, -end. Um, so, so I think that's probably the biggest difference. Um, not, not to say that like the kind of communities in America are not like actively doing these type of stuff. Just maybe just it's a bias because that's where all our kind of BD is focused on, but that's kind of the general feedback I've been seeing. Um, any, any insights there, Calvin, too, of what you've been saying? Um, not to you know, sound like a broken record, but I, I think I have to reiterate what John said, to be honest. So we legitimate helps brands and projects create digital products, physical products that are tied to NFTs via NFC tags. And you know, we've been operating for the last four years, uh, specifically in the States. Mm. And getting this off the ground in the States was actually really, really hard. Um, one, primarily because nobody really talked about NFTs back in 2019. Um, and two, nobody in the States really knows how to use NFC readers. Like, that's not a thing in the States. So what we've actually seen... A Apple Pay came in. Apple Pay recently. came in, right, right. But what we've seen is that in Europe and in East Asia, NFC is a really big part of just everything. I mean, like, contactless payments, um, you know, uh, anything from like sending sort of like contact info that's been around for decades and as it pertains to NFTs specific NFTs, sorry, specifically with what we do as like a digital ecosystem, um, we're seeing way more sort of interest in places like Japan, in places like Hong Kong, where people already know how to interact with, you know, these types of technologies. Uh, and I think as that propagates, hopefully well, that will spread uh, further. Um, in terms of towards the West, but no, I mean, J Japan, Hong Kong, East Asia as a whole is, is, is really, really popping off right now. So like, think about the, the Western part of the world. Uh, what do you think is missing to kind of activate uh, kind of the regional aspect of that? Uh, what do you think would trigger uh, a more of a mass adoption in the Americas or the East or Europe in that sense? Um, yeah, I would love to get your thoughts on that. Like, what do you guys think is missing? So I think on the one hand, there's a bit of the like, just the, the kind of wow factor. So this is the stuff when someone will say, oh, games, you know, okay, if gaming NFTs are gonna take off, the games have to be exceptional, right? Or the metaverses have to be truly immersive. Or real world utility, next level, right? So it's not just a buy and hold, but it's that I'm, um, I don't know, I own a piece of land, I'm in a focus group with the brand, I vote on this, I then participate in something. So, so just a, a lot more of this, this experience can only exist because of this NFT, um, I, I think is, is one side of it. Um, you think it's a little too forward, forward facing versus a more of a practical, like what do I get today? So, so I think of it in two. So one is the today, making these cases like hit you with the experience and then the other is perhaps the more esoteric um and so th so the way i think of that is like digital assets i guess beyond speculative use cases should be really interesting if we can transfer value in new ways or if they coordinate people 
in ways that we can't do before. Um, and that's the more esoteric, right? It's like, could there be something where I'm, I don't know, contributing a view to the IMF alongside someone in China and somewhere else, input on policy that I can't do today? Um, and so I, I think if one of those take hold, that's like, wow, I see this intersecting my life, um, and I could never engage with this amorphic cross-border community, I think that would open up creativity beyond um, like the first speculative for the art people, for the crypto native, PFP addicted people. Yeah, so I think from our observation working with both Western and Asian customers, in Asia, usually when customers approach us, it's driven by like a top-down mandate, like the chairman or the CEO wants to do something like this. And they're very, usually very bold. They want to do something flashy. They're like, they want to take risks. So that's why a lot of these activations are more complicated. It's more immersive. You can do more besides just, again, just a JPEG or just accessing an event. Whereas in America, the people that we're connected to are usually like maybe middle manager that have to, I mean, they have to show that, oh yeah, I'm innovating, but at the same time, I can't be too innovative just because in case I screw up, I'm gonna look bad in front of my boss. Um, so I think that's why there's a bit of disconnect between the two cultures. Um, but I think as we kind of show more successful use cases in Asia and bring that towards the Western market, I think more and more of these managers would be able to show that case study to their boss and see that, hey, actually it's not risky at all. Um, they're not only better, but they're also cheaper than the Web2 alternatives. So, why not do this? So, so thinking about that a little bit, um, what do you think has been established now with a lot of the Western companies and brands crossing over to NFTs? Uh, the Starbucks one uh, has been minted twice now. Uh, AWS just announced their own marketplace as well. So uh, we'd love to kind of think about what you guys think on uh, how do Western brands or Western companies uh, evolve into more of the adoption phase with what we just spoke about? I actually, you know, continuing from what we were talking about for the last question, I actually think there are parts of the world that lag behind the Americas or even, you know, Europe in terms of technical innovation. Um, but what we're seeing is actually those parts of the world really kind of doubling down, tripling down um, where the States or Europe hasn't, right? In terms of NFTs, you know, I, I think I just flew in from Tokyo after ETH Tokyo, and I think they're, you know, yeah, we, they are talking about things that the rest of the world has started talking about, you know, maybe six to nine months ago. But their commitment to sort of seeing it through and building it out is so integral to sort of that culture as a whole that I think a lot of what we're pioneering in the West is already moving east and being magnified there. So I think, you know, the best case scenario is there's a chain reaction where it bounces back to the West and kind of encourages sort of almost a, a race to kind of build out like more and more features or, or just better user and customer experiences. But I don't necessarily think that it's sort of a who comes first type of situation as much as who, who does it, you know, well. I mean, that's a really good point because, uh, you know, we, we did recently hear about like Facebook divesting into kind of the NFT area. Um, but we also see a lot of like people uh, adopting NFTs as more of a standard inside, uh, you know, Asia and kind of the APAC region. So um, I think that's a really good like insight uh, is that the West can always like, you know, like do the first like degree of like integration and then eventually I think uh, Asia or like, other regions are trying to kind of leapfrog into it for the next few steps. I also don't want to get into sort of politics and all that, but I think like in terms of legislation and, and restrictions, like that plays a huge part in what's happening right now. Um, I know a lot of people are obviously scared to do certain things in, in the States or in Europe where, you know, that, that sort of restriction doesn't exist in other jurisdictions or, or major markets really. I think speaking of regulation and regulatory concerns, uh, what do you guys see like uh, some of the issues arising for some of the NFT art that's coming out uh, or in general like 
tax purposes or uh, ways we, we kind of like uh, classify what NFTs are going to be if there is utility in the future? Do you see regulation changing for that or being adjusted? A good example is like, what if I earn uh, by having this NFT or getting residuals because of this? Yeah, I mean, I think at a high level, the more NFTs are not like, again, the asset that holds value, so like the art or the collectible, and they're like a representation of something else that looks more like other economic assets. So an example, it's like if, if I, the, the, the I think the one we've spoken about a lot, but maybe, and if, no offense if anyone in this room is, is bringing this to prime time, but kind of the IP on chain, right? So that idea, or like loyalty streams, or even if, if like an NFT is a business. So if I put like a cash generating asset, if I have a YouTube video, but instead of YouTube, it's my NFT video and it accrues advertising fees, like suddenly these start to not just be an asset that you buy and sell, there are things that are more complicated from an accounting, from an ownership, from an asset transfer perspective. Um, so that's kind of a total flop of a non-answer if you were looking for a prediction on regulation, except to say maybe it's just, it's gonna get more complicated and um, maybe a new accountant at EY should start to make his, his name on this because he'll get more business over time. I'd prefer if they didn't do that so we could take advantage of some of these tax benefits, but yeah, I, I do agree. I think it's gonna be very complicated. Uh, love to get what your thoughts are too, John. I think from our, our specific vertical, which is ticketing and membership, I don't actually see that as, as a big of a problem just because like, you don't see regulators going after Starbucks with their existing Web2 membership, right? And by and large, for the most part, our memberships are kind of like that. Yes, it's transferable, but technically Starbucks could have made theirs transferable too. So I don't see a valid argument for now whereby regulators could say that um, what we're building is against certain securities law. Um, and it, for sure for ticketing as well, we're, like, we're basically just selling tickets as NFTs, just like Eventbrite, just like Ticketmaster, but only difference is that our tickets are NFTs. And obviously we have a lot of additional immersive experience that comes from it, but none of those are like investments. Like you don't get monetary value from it besides just getting more experience. So uh, from my, uh, I, I don't really expect, at least for now, to see more regulation unless um, and this is back in my Web2 days where we saw there is a lot of lobbying that happens from like traditional players that are very close to regulators. Maybe that might happen. Maybe Ticketmaster might come in and lobby with the government and say that for whatever reason, uh, we are building something that I guess is against security law, then, then maybe that might happen. But I don't think that's truly justified. I think, and I think John, I might want to pick your brain on this too, since I think we both work to onboard traditional brands into Web3 via NFTs, but not PFP NFTs, especially not NFTs that have speculative value. Um, one of the hardest things for me personally and our company to kind of get across the line is with the media, with the noise, a lot of these companies are coming into these conversations really scared of the legal implications because of the uncertainty around regulation. So actually when we go to a company and pitch, hey, actually you can turn your t-shirts and you can turn your like sneakers into NFTs by leveraging our technology, putting these tags in your shoes, you know, they're scared of the word NFT. But if we like take that word away, all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, we, you know, like that totally makes sense. Like let's do it end-to-end -end authenticity, you know, digital experiences. So I think almost in a good way, one, this bear market, bear market, if we can call it that, is actually helping because there's a lot less noise in this space. But two, I think from a media perspective, like from a Twitter perspective, I think we just all need to do better. I'm sorry if there are any journalists out there that I might have offended, but like totally in terms of like what you guys are reporting on, 
that impacts the space more than anything else. Any sort of technical advancement we can do, these brands are looking at the Cointelegraphs, the you know, Washington Post, the New York Times, especially New York Times, um, in terms of what they report about blockchain, about crypto, about Web3. And I think like Samantha said, NFTs as a whole can be representative of more than just a PFP speculative asset, right? And, and you're talking about even like new EIPs that are coming out, 6551, where like NFTs can represent complicated entities that own other things and, and, and otherwise. I think we just need to change sort of the, the general perception of what an NFT is. Uh, so I know we have a little bit of time left, but uh, I wanted to end on this one last note, which was uh, kind of extending what you said. Um, what is one thing you would want to be changed uh, in kind of the market today um, to proliferate kind of the expansion of NFTs? Uh, what, is, what is holding us back and what is one thing you would love to really address? I don't think this is addressable, but there are a lot of middlemen, even in what we do now. Like, if you want to connect to a brand, there's always, like, consultants in the middle that want to take a cut. And a lot of times, these guys would end up, like, jeopardizing the entire deal because the economics just don't sit right with them. And that's just so stupid to me because the brand wants to do it, we're ready to do it, but the middleman just cuts the deal, uh, it just falls apart because of the middleman. So I don't think it's possible, but it would be great if we could somehow be able to co directly connect with the brands and just bypass the middleman and just make things even smoother. Do you think the brands right now uh, just don't know who to connect with or well, what's, what's your experience been like of why these middlemen are so uh, important to the, to the process today? Yeah, so I think the brands, <clears throat> generally, they, they don't want to put all their eggs in one basket, right? If they have someone on their team that's saying, hey, this, this company is good, but ends up being like a shitty company, it's on them, right? But if it's through a consultant, they could kind of shift the blame to them. Um, and obviously, a lot of times, these consultants are a lot more connected in the space. They know who's around, they know who's not. Um, but I think as, uh, as our companies grow bigger, I think gradually we wouldn't really need these uh, consultants to just interfere with business. I think for me, um, it's probably just changing a short-term mindset. And, and maybe I'd, I'd muse kind of supply-demand dynamics in this space. And so what I mean by that is if you build for demand today, right, that's kind of like, DGen and Web3 native, you're going to build a certain thing. Um, and that, that's fine if you assume the resources are infinite. Um, if they're not, then you have a misallocation of capital, right? So you're putting a lot of your eggs on things that find happy, um, eager audiences today, and you might not be funding these kind of bigger ideas that would really bring in new audiences, right? That really change the way they interact, that really change the way they live, change other industries. You're, you're staying kind of incestuous. Um, so yeah, the risk of misallocation of capital. Final thoughts, Calvin? Uh, Twitter thought leaders. I think we need to get rid of them. Wait, what about Twitter thought leaders? I, I, I think they, they, they are har harmful too. Okay, the yes. <laughs> so get rid of Twitter. Well, well that's, that's a very blanket statement. I'm sorry, if you're actually, you know, tweeting valuable insights and knowledge, then, then uh, keep doing that. Amazing. Are you, are you talking about more like NFT influencers? Yeah, I think, okay. I think, I think so. I think, I think more so, like, especially with the rise of AI, um, you know, it, it takes me like maybe 10 minutes to spin up a ChatGPT Twitter bot to say five things you need to know about the NFT space, like c c going into May 2023 or whatever, right? And, and I think there's so much noise there, and I think, with sort of, we're seeing a movement away from Twitter towards Blue Sky, but I think new people who enter the space think they have to do Twitter and like have to do GMs, like you know, 500 GMs a day or whatever. I, I just think as a space, we need to move beyond that. Um, and I, I know I'm gonna anger, anger a lot of people by saying this, but that's just so, so done. Last cycle, last cycle. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for your time. Uh, really appreciate your thoughts and feedback. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.